911 police emergency. A hit and run driver left the scene of the crime, but he took something with him, something very important. And he left behind a piece of forensic evidence that microscopically told a story more graphic than any eyewitness could ever have told. February night in 1995, Todd Christensen, a Kalamazoo, Michigan policeman, was on duty in his patrol car. Things had been quiet, and Christensen thought it was going to remain so. I was actually eating dinner in my car, relaxing with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, uh, when a frantic citizen came up and uh, pulled up next to me. He told Christensen that a man was badly hurt a couple of blocks away. When Christensen got there, the man was alive, but just barely. He was what I call circling the drain. His breathing was, was not good. He was doing all he could to just uh, suck in air at that time. Major head trauma. The victim, 33-year-old Kirk Hudson, was rushed to the local hospital. When I went into the room and I saw him laying there and his injuries, he just didn't hardly look like the same person. So it was real hard. And my mom was, of course, real upset. That was her only son. So it was very upsetting. Hudson never regained consciousness. He was pronounced dead before police could find out what had happened. When my brother passed away, it affected our whole family. My mom suffered two nervous breakdowns. It affected all of us. Kirk's death was the final act in a series of tragedies. He was an unemployed Navy veteran whose 28-year-old wife died of cancer just a few years earlier. At the time of his death, he had been caring for his mother. She was sick and elderly. At the accident scene, police found a damaged bicycle near Kirk's body. What we saw is definitely evidence of a crime. The vehicle parts, the mangled up bicycle, the person lying in a pool of blood would lead any reasonable officer to believe that this guy got hit by a vehicle and then that vehicle then left. Kirk's family told police he often rode his bicycle at night. I think maybe that was how maybe he did relieve his stress. It didn't faze him really what time it was. He was a night person. <laughs> so that was his thing, you know, he'd ride his bike at night or wherever he wanted to do. Near Kirk's bicycle, police found a trail of plastic and glass fragments, a small convex mirror, some paint chips, and an antenna. The first thing that ran through my mind was the driver of this vehicle was obviously drunk. Someone left the bar, ran this guy over, either knew it or didn't know it, regardless, and left because they were drunk and didn't want to get caught by the police. This trail of vehicle parts led north along the street, indicating the direction of the driver. From Kirk's head injuries, police determined that he was riding the bike with the traffic on the right side of the road when he was hit from behind. This meant that the hit and run vehicle would have had right front end damage. There was no evidence the driver used his brakes before or after he struck Kirk. And Kirk's family couldn't understand why someone would leave him to die in the street. This was just an accident. He didn't mean to do it, or she didn't mean to do it. We just wanted them, you know, to say to us. <laughs> that they were sorry for what they had did. And that they didn't mean to do it. So that's all we wanted.
There were no eyewitnesses to Kirk Hudson's hit-and-run death. But the force of impact left little doubt that the driver who hit him knew what happened. How could they just hit him and then just leave him there? To me, that was just, I couldn't even believe it. I was like, you know, why couldn't they have just stopped? The only clues to the driver's identity were some pieces of truck or car parts left at the scene. We knew that the evidence on top of the ice was fresh because if it wasn't fresh, it had been frozen in the ice. So all the pieces of light lens, the antenna, reflector lens, any parts of the bicycle, the fresh paint, all sitting on top, we knew it was fresh. Crime scene technicians identified the location of each piece with a numbered marker and then drew a detailed diagram of the scene. Every piece, there were 28 in all, was then photographed. But it was doubtful whether these tiny clues would be enough to identify the vehicle. After I collected things from the scene, I thought that we'd done the best job we could. But I gave it about a 30% chance of ever finding the vehicle that was involved. I didn't think that we stood a real good chance. Among the pieces of the vehicle were also paint chips. One of the chips was a little bigger than a quarter and contained a wealth of information. There were two distinct colors on the chip with a line running through them. It was a tri-colored piece of paint chip. It was a maroon color a black pinstripe and moth. That was very unique. That's a two-tone vehicle with a pinstripe. A background check revealed there were very few vehicles sold with that color combination, which raised the possibility that it was a custom paint job. That helped uh, narrow the scope of what we were looking for even more. Next, investigators turned to the shards of orange plastic recovered from the scene. Under the microscope, they found a combination of small cubes and rectangles designed to reflect and shine light. This meant it was most likely from a turn signal or parking light. Investigators then took each shard and attempted to piece together what they had. You literally may have one piece that's broke here and another piece that fits into it, or you get jagged pieces and they all come together microscopically, and that's what you look for. On one shard, investigators found a pentagon with a star inside. It looked like a Chrysler Dodge logo. On this shard, there appeared to be a serial number. The one part had some markings on it, some numbers on it, and I was in hopes that it would be uh, part numbers that we could identify what type of vehicle this lens had, coming from, had came from. So investigators gathered all the pieces from the crime scene and went to a local Chrysler Dodge dealership. And there, parts manager David Johnson found himself doing something well outside his job description. I'd read about it in the paper about the person getting hit in downtown Kalamazoo, and they thought it might be a van of some kind that had done it. And when the officer came in and questioned us, it's like, wow, I wonder if it was a Dodge. Johnson confirmed these pieces were from the plastic casing of a turn signal. He then took the serial number and went through old parts manuals and discovered another piece of the puzzle. There was no doubt in my mind what this came off of. It had to be off of a Dodge van. Once we saw the paint chip and the antenna on it, I knew it had to be a conversion van because those were not standard items. A conversion van is customized to the owner's specifications. Johnson said the parts from the turn signal indicated the vehicle was a Dodge Ram, a van made between 1986 and 1993. But a closer look at the small mirror found at the scene narrowed this down even further. This was a customized part and was only available from 1986 to 1987. Police now knew the make and model of the vehicle that killed Kirk Hudson within a two-year range. 
we were in a real big hurry to try to find the vehicle. Time is, is pretty critical. You know, you don't want that vehicle sitting out there for a long period of time. Incredibly, in Kalamazoo alone, there were hundreds of vehicles fitting that description. Nationwide, tens of thousands. And the driver and his van could be anywhere. After examining pieces of the vehicle that killed Kirk Hudson, police knew they were looking for a 1986 or 87 Mauve and Maroon Dodge Ram, a conversion van with a black pinstripe. Police had a list of the hundreds of people whose vans fit the description. Well, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. It's not an easy thing to do. Kirk Hudson's family was informed, but warned not to get their hopes up. My brother did have a family and they did care. You know, he was a person and, and it was important for us to follow through on this and make sure that justice was served. A description of the van was released to the media. Some calls came in, but they were all dead ends. Then, about a month after Kirk Hudson's death, a customer in a local bar started to ask some questions. I was at my normal seat, and the bartender said something about an accident where a guy on a bicycle had been killed. And I said, really went. The woman who asked that she remain anonymous wanted to know more about the accident. When she heard the accident took place just a few blocks from the bar and read the description of the hit and run vehicle, she suspected she knew the identity of the driver. They had the only Dodge van in that neighborhood that color. I don't even remember what year his Dodge van was, how old it was or new it was or whatever. I just know that that van, it had to be his van. She called police to voice her suspicion that the driver of the van was Jim Northey. And she said, she was with Northy on the night of the accident. The two had been drinking together. Well, I couldn't even possibly come close to saying how many he had. I wasn't keeping track. She said Northy left the bar alone in his van shortly before the accident occurred. Northy was 46 years old and had seven previous convictions for drunk driving. Vehicle records confirmed he owned a 1987 Dodge Ram conversion van, the same color as the one in the accident. But when police discovered where Northey worked, they started to doubt whether they'd ever solved the case. I worked at this local recycling place where they shred vehicles. We were afraid that the vehicle got shredded and it's in a, a thousand pieces out there in the junkyard someplace. Police rushed to Northey's home and found the windows of his garage taped closed with towels and plastic bags. Nobody could see inside, uh, which is unusual for a garage, which just got up my interest even more. When questioned, Jim Northey denied he was involved in a hit and run accident, but he acknowledged that his wife had driven the van and gotten into a minor traffic accident a few weeks earlier. I could see that the van had been involved in an accident. The front light, uh, right light assembly had been replaced. It was just hanging there from the wire. But police weren't sure how they could tell whether the damage was caused by the hit and run accident or the other traffic accident Northey referred to. Then, almost by chance, police discovered an important clue. When I got to a workbench, it was covered with uh, several things, tools, uh, work stuff, that type of thing. And I proceeded to take uh, everything off from this workbench, just piece by piece. And as I got to the bottom, I found one piece of orange lens, light lens, just like the ones we'd found out at the scene. But it wasn't enough just to find a similar piece of plastic. The most important thing was, did it match? Although 
though Jim Northey denied hitting Kirk Hudson with his van, police confiscated the vehicle and ran it through a series of tests. The first thing we did is we, we processed the van with luminol. We looked for trace blood. Uh, we next processed the, the van to see if there was any hairs or fibers that came from the victim. But more than a month had passed since Kirk Hudson's death, and there was no biological link between Northey's van and the crime scene. So police turned to more durable evidence, the plastic and paint from the suspect vehicle. A comparison analysis was done on a paint sample from Northey's van and paint chips from the crime scene. The colors and chemical composition of both samples were identical. The state police crime lab did match up um, paint from the, the vehicle and paint from the scene. Next, investigators turned to the tiny chip of plastic they'd found on Northey's workbench. As if they were putting together a jigsaw puzzle, they tried to fit this chip into the turn signal partially reassembled from the crime scene. Incredibly, the piece fit. When an amber lens breaks, the pieces don't ever break the same way again. So basically, we had a fingerprint found at the scene, there was no doubt. This tiny shard of plastic told an important story. It was proof that Jim Northey had removed the broken turn signal lens, placed it temporarily on his workbench, and when he went to throw the broken item away, inadvertently left behind this one tiny piece that matched the broken pieces at the crime scene. Investigators now turned to Kirk Hudson's bike. They placed it next to the suspect van in an attempt to gauge the point of contact. There was a dent in the bicycle that would have been similar from where the van hit it, the same height, the same location, passenger side, just all kinds of jigsaw puzzle pieces fitting together like a glove. I saw the damage to the bicycle matching up to the van, the parking light lens at the same height as the seat, the color scheme of the van as to what we picked up out there, the antenna. I got that warm, fuzzy feeling that uh, we'd done our job. We'd, we'd got the vehicle involved. Based on the forensic evidence, Jim Northey was charged with leaving the scene of a fatal accident. It was good to have the person's name. That was important. Not that we knew him, but just who it was. That maybe, you know, we could get some closure. Northey was offered a chance to plead to a lesser charge in exchange for a reduced sentence, but he refused. The defense team was convinced the tiny bits of plastic and paint assembled by forensic technicians weren't enough to convince a jury. But they faced a major hurdle. Since no one had seen Northey driving, all they had was the physical evidence to put his van at the crime scene. There were no eyewitnesses. And when there are no eyewitnesses, it's, that remains a difficult part to sort out in your mind until you hear all the evidence. The pieces of amber parking light lens that you took from the scene. During the trial, prosecutors spent hours telling the jury how each and every piece of plastic and paint fit together. When completed, it told the story of how Kirk Hudson had been hit and left to die. Scientific evidence is always compelling. Juries love scientific evidence. They watch CSI, they watch your show. Uh, this is the rare type of case where we actually have a lot of scientific evidence. It had to be more than coincidence that a piece of plastic or a paint chip or a piece of glass doesn't just happen to be there. And when they uh, showed them blew them up, magnified them. It was easy to see how they exactly matched. And that was very convincing as a juror. All of these little markers here that I referred to are pieces of evidence. After a three-day trial and only four hours of deliberation, the jury found Jim Northey guilty. 
The jury put him behind that wheel beyond a reasonable doubt, and that pretty much is the end of the story. He was sentenced to four years in prison. Kirk Hudson's family still grieves, but they're grateful the killer unknowingly left behind the information that led to his capture. I know that all those little pieces came to be one piece that really, you know, helped solve the case. Maybe if this had happened 20 years ago, it might not have gotten solved, but it took all those little pieces to come together to get it solved, so we're very grateful for that. Evidence is great for any criminal proceeding. It's, you know, I can sit here and say, you ran a stop sign, and you say, no, I didn't, but if I say, I got your fingerprint, or I got your parking light, you can't argue it. It's evidence. Another moral of this story is dogged police work and investigation, patience, determination, can bring people to justice that otherwise might have avoided it.